Sure. All right. Uh, before I speak, may I confirm I have the permission to share slides? Yeah. Yes. I think so. Okay, maybe take them. Um, yeah. Yes, sure. you have. Yes, all right, good. Okay, so uh, my topic today uh, will be on um, just a minute and uh, just confirm that. Good. So, um, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, already 4 p.m. in Kenya. I'm receiving the call. I'm receiving the call from St. Paul's University in Limuru, and it's now 4 p.m. I'm glad to see all of you uh, seated and waiting to hear from me uh, speaking about legacy of women in the logical education in Kenya. I picked this uh, topic because of women in theological education best describes my positionality uh, as for now. I teach at Pan Africa Christian University uh, in Mission, World Christianity, and History and Mission. That's my area of speciality, and that's my positionality. And I just thought my experiences as a woman teaching theology education in Kenya. I, I have something to say on what other women have done before me, what they are doing at present, and the future projections of women engagement in the logical education in Kenya and beyond. The methodology I envision to utilize is experiential methodology with close reference to the works of pioneer women uh, in the logical education of whom I'm, I'm going to introduce as I move forward in this presentation. When I talk about experiential methodology, uh, please allow me to use a lot of my experiences, narrations as a methodology from my own experiences, which highlights what it means for a woman like me to be in the theological discourse and the theological education. So uh, the questions that come on your screen, uh, I took them from the first day I started teaching, that is five years ago. And I remember when I entered in the class to teach, uh, the title of my name was just Dr. Kehuha. I don't know uh, what the students expected, but when I came in, I could clearly see they did not have a person like me in their mind. So some of the questions that were raised from that first instance were, how old are you? Are you married? Are you ordained? Why did you graduate? Where did you graduate? And which church do you belong to? At that point, I just realized that my academic credentials were not questions. And even it was not even enough to have notes. It was not enough to have my slides prepared. There were other questions that I did not anticipate. There were other discourses that I did not anticipate. And at that point in, the, in front of the classroom, ready to engage with, uh, the theological tenets of missiology, I was caught off guard as the discourse was now turned it to me to be asked, how old are you? Are you married? And uh, to, to, quite, to be quite honest, I did not have all these questions in my slides, in my notes. So this caught me off guard. When I went home, I wrote down all those questions. I, I wrote them down on my diary and I was just asking myself, what is the real question here? Because there, there seemed to have been a real question that uh, I did not know, but I just sat down, sat with the questions, sat with myself, 
sat with my academic credentials and I asked myself, what is the real question? When I had a discourse with my friends, other women from who are also in theological education, when we had a, a small discussion to analyze the questioning, the line of questioning, what appeared to be the real question was, do you have the legitimacy to teach theology? I think that was the main question. And as I sit across the computer at the world apart, this has continued to be question that has been queried on all women from all walks of life. The old ones are faced with this question. The middle-aged women are faced with this question. And even our matrix continues to be faced with this question. Do you have the, legis the legitimacy to teach theology? Coming from a Pentecostal tradition, I had understood teaching as a gift of the Holy Spirit who legitimizes those gifted to teach. But myself, faced with all these questions, it also appeared that the Holy Spirit, plus my academic credentials, <clears throat> appeared not to be enough, questions and doubts lingered. It is at this point, uh, I turned to matriarchs for wisdom. Uh, within African culture, we turn to the elders, we turn to the matriarchs for some wisdom, Maybe perhaps when you, graduate with a PhD, you might think, oh, you know everything. But at that juncture, I had to consult with the works of the matriarchs. And these matriarchs um, who I see as the pioneers uh, of promoting the logical the participation logical. Of, of women both as faculty, and students. Oh, sorry. Um, I seem to have feedback. Matrix are the pioneers. We'll check just a minute to see who is. Naomi. Yeah. Okay. Continue. Thank you. Uh, so as I was saying, as I was faced by these uh, questions that appeared to poke holes on my qualifications and legitimacy to teach theology, I remembered uh, African living and wisdom from uh, matrix. And uh, the matrix in uh, the logical education within Africa included the work of uh, Professor Esther Mombo, the work of Musimbi Kanyoro, the work of Masi Amba Oduyeye, the work of Filomena Mwaura, of which I had to engage myself with to know how do I forge forward as an incoming uh, faculty of theology within this space. So I looked at Masi Amba Oduyeye, who realized that while women were a majority in faith-based organization, they were also visibly absent in religious leadership and theological training. Religious beliefs and texts were often interpreted and used to buttress and leg legitimize women's marginalization. So in the context which Mercy was working with was not legitimizing women teaching theology. Instead, it appeared to legitimize women's marginalization so immediately I just knew that the question I'm struggling with has a long tradition within the African space of the logical education. And I picked things like absence of women, which Marcy was picking. I noticed uh, 
uh, absent in the region's leadership, but I also notice a majority in faith-based organization, which immediately created a paradox in my head. So uh, following her efforts of, in 1989, the Circle of Concerned Africa Women was launched in Legon, Ghana by a group of 70 founding members. Now, even if I wasn't present there in Ghana in 1989, the works of these women became critical in my scholarship. I have said that I belong to the Pentecostal tradition in Kenya. My church name is Pentecostal Fellowship of Africa. And I was seeking to analyze and to document the agency of women and participation in, in the church. And one thing I immediately realized, I did not find any materials from my church, from the Pentecostal tradition. I could not find any materials. So I had to use what the circle had, had produced to build a theological framework, to build, to build an African woman framework of which I could locate myself from a Pentecostal tradition. So the work became very detrimental in my, in my, in my, in my scholarship. Some of the uh, circle's work, which uh, includes the legacy that has been built by what happened in Ghana 1989 and continues to be built was the promotion of women voices in theology. Uh, the invisibility of African women's theology uh, continues to be a, a problem and a challenge in African theology. As we all know that uh, when there was discourse for the construction of uh, African theology, it was highly articulated by men at that point. It was highly uh, spoken about and it was presented by men to the world. But uh, the theology that was presented coming from Africa ignored the plight of women who struggled with African culture that was patriarchal. So there was missing of women's voice who would perhaps challenge the African patriarchy that continued to relegate women to the margins. So uh, the circle was established with the primary goal of promoting the voices and perspectives of African women in theological discourse. It has played a crucial role in creating a space for African women to get engaged in theological reflection and scholarship. So this has been on, uh, ongoing. And uh, the last one, the last uh, space happened five years ago in Botswana where women came together and continued theologizing the issues that affect the African women. Another aspect, a lasting legacy of these women in theological education is research and writing. And research and, and the scholars have distinguished themselves by pioneering work in different subjects, especially HIV and AIDS, and uh, also COVID-19, which was a pandemic that came after HIV AIDS. And um, the direction the circle took in looking at HIV AIDS is that HIV AIDS uh, affected women, it affected women more. The women brought the, the pandemic more than, than the men because they had to be the carers, they had to be, so the African women, the circle women engaged the HIV AIDS and how the church reacted to it. Also during the COVID-19, there have been uh, research and publication that has come out to engage on how the African women have theologized the COVID-19, how the church has responded. And this is built on the cognition that again, it's women who beard the brand. The scholarship of this subject is ongoing and the published works have influenced the teaching of this course or mainstreaming it in different institutions. Uh, for example, uh, in St. Paul's University, uh, 
gender and HIV AIDS is a subject that's already mainstreamed in the curriculum. The study of this is both as a health pandemic and the issues it brings rise to like gender-based violence. The circle is currently engaged with the environment crisis and the threat it poses to African women. So there have been engagement, uh, there have been a production of books of looking at Mother Earth again on how climate injustice, environment crisis intersects with the plight uh, of women because it's all it's all connected. From our research, we found that the more women have to go to long distances to look for water, the more they have to go long distances to look for firewood. That's when they are exposed to gender-based violence. So the work of SACO have highlighted how these pandemics, how these, uh, how environmental crisis intersects with gender-based violence, which continues to uh, be oppressive for the women. African women theologies has been instrumental in the construction and promotion of African women theologies. The members have produced numerous theological writings that address gender-based inequalities and women rights that have centered the African women's experience. As I have noted before in the beginning is that uh, initially, the work that came from Africa, the work, the logical work that came Africa was constructed by male, which did not highlight the experience of, of women. And the experience of women here, uh, it's experience of women in the church, experience of the child of, of women in the society experience of women even in the political spaces mentorship the circle has actively engaged in theological theological education by organizing conferences workshops and seminars that focuses on issues related to gender religion and theology these events have helped train and mentor the next generation of African women theologians. The circle today celebrates an emergence of fourth generation of rising stars who are actively engaged in churches, universities, and uh, the societies. As I present today, I, I am the fourth generation of uh, the circle and continue to mentor and to carry the, the dialogue. As I teach at the university, I continue to engage the materials that were have been written 30 years ago. And so mentorship, and even as we are not just thinking of ourselves as mentees, but also taking the role of mentorship seriously within, within the churches that we are involved in, within the universities that we are involved in, and within, um, within the society. Uh, emergence of women leaders has, as a result of increased study of religion and culture, and this has been seen as an unholy intersection of religion, which have, uh, which have legitimized the marginalization of women and also African culture, which is largely patriarchal. The circle have uh, studied this and endured uh, or embarked to see how religion can be engendered and to see how we can engender culture so that women can take on leadership decision in different organization. There have been many leaders who have um, come out of women in theological edu education and led organizations that are, para, are not, are even worldwide, are global that goes beyond Kenya and Africa. One such person is Young Women Christian Association, uh, Musimbi Kanyoro, for instance, uh, World Council of Churches, and we have seen women like Masi, Nyambura, Isabel Fulasha, Moyo, Isabel Fidi, the Lutheran World Federation, and all African Council of Churches, Lydia Moneki, and other women have found their leadership and teaching in the religious and theology departments of universities and even uh, seminaries. 
I could go on and on uh, mentioning a lot of names who have, women have found um, themselves in leadership spaces. And I think I might uh, mention here that uh, one thing that made women to remain in margins was actually margins. I mean, it was absence of their voices in leadership spaces, but because of um, the work that have been done, we have begun to see women entering leadership uh, leadership spaces, and not just within church, not just within you know, the theological institution. Even this has been spread out to other spheres of life. Moving forward, despite the headways that have been made, been made by the women in the circle, the challenges persist. I, I, I don't mean to, um, to, be, to be negative or to paint a negative picture, but uh, despite the headways that we have seen, despite the work that have been done, there uh, may be still some of the challenges that uh, was spoken, that were discussed in 1989 continues to be persistent. I began by uh, explaining my personal experience of the first day of teaching theology. And that was 30 years later in 2019, I was still asked the same questions that were asked women in the eighties. Even when the headway seemed to have been made, even when a mountain seems to have been made, their, their challenges persist. One of the challenges that I have highlighted is male dominance uh, in theological education. And there are many reasons for this, which I'll attempt uh, to explain. This is because for a long time in Kenya, theological education was tied to ordination. And so many churches were did not want to pay to invest in maybe younger women because they ask what will happen if you get married we shall invest in her but she'll get married in another church so you find the theological education was denied but was denied for women because of the idea what will happen what if they get married to a different country and for the women who are married questions were asked what will happen to her family what will happen to her husband what will happen to our children. And because of such factors, today, male dominance in the logical education continues to be um, an, identifi an identifiable phenomenon. I've had chances, I've had chances uh, to teach uh, since 2019 in various classes. And one of the issues I've observed, as I said, I'll I will look at my personal experiences and 60%, 60% yes, of the classes I've taught, I found myself as the only female. I'm the teacher, but I found myself to be the only female, maybe out of 20 male students, I'm the only female. So male dominance in theological education, and I try to explain why this continues because the logical education is still seen as a domain for men because it leads to church leadership. And within Kenyan context, church leadership, while headways have been made, strong breakthroughs have not been made where people envisions women leadership in that space. Also, the dogma or uh, the theological framework of doing theology, doing church, doing the society, largely is a, is a patriarchal theological framework which have persisted. So yes, there's work of the circle, but uh, re reports or something I've heard that even uh, in Ghana, a lot of women, a lot of women and men still are not cognizant, are not conversant with the work of mercy, Amba Oduye. A lot of our students or a lot of uh, our, our community knows a lot of work from men, but they do not know the work of women 
within the circles. So that means that the, uh, the patriarchal theological framework persists. And this does not just mean it's only the men who presents a patriarchal theological framework. A patriarchal theological framework is also presented by women. So at this point, we are saying, or our observation has been, it's not enough to have a woman preaching. It's not enough to have a woman teaching. It's not enough. The next question, we ask is what kind of what kind of theology, what kind of um, theological framework is she presenting? In my introduction, I said that uh, I'm a researcher. Uh, I'm a researcher. Uh, of, uh, I think I also think have. Also have. Um, In the beginning of my introduction, I said I'm also an Agel Institute research. And here we have been looking at uh, African kingship structures and how they are transposed in the urban Pentecostalism. Our main argument has been that in our Kenya, the urban, the rural urban migration has happened. And uh, the traditional African thought is a, in the kingship structure is a headship of, of man and, uh, and the whole patriarchal look, outlook of family. And so when we were doing our research to see how is that traditional African kingship structure transposed to urban Pentecostalism, we found that it is being transposed almost 100%. That the African traditional kingship structures is what is being experienced, is what is being practiced even within urban Pentecostalism. And in this space, we find that largely, even when within Pentecostal tradition, there are a lot of women preachers, a lot of women teachers, but the kind of theology that is presented in the urban Pentecostalism is heavily borrowed from the African traditional patriarchal structures, which uh, remains to be, to be a challenge. And I come back to my initial statement that it's no longer, it's no longer enough to say how many women do we have? How many women leaders do we have? The question, the real question is what kind of theology is, is being presented. So from the church, from the society, we see that a, a, patriarchal, a patriarchal theological framework persists. As I conclude, I want to conclude by uh, highlighting the, uh, and I'm asking the question as I conclude, yes, we have the challenges but uh, do we have resources? Yeah, there are uh, the work of the circle that has brought in African women voices, research and writing, documentation and research, but the problem persists. But even when the problem persists, what do I envision as way forward? Do we have the resources to counter the challenges? The first uh, resource I envision, among others that I have not written in the PowerPoint, the first one is uh, theological resources. And we see uh, theological resources in terms of uh, the materials that have come from the circle of concern, African women theologians, that continues to be used in universities, that continues to be used by others. I've, told, I've said my story that even when I could not find theological resources within my Pentecostal tradition. I could not say I do not have resources because I have resource, I had resources from the, from the circle. Um, there's a large pool of women in theology. Uh, there's a sisterhood coming out. Uh, and this is seen in uh, that we usually have meetings uh, as a circle. 
So there's a large pool of women in theology and this is this sisterhood in writing and research is what is required to continue furthering the work of the of the matrix because as you realize theology cannot be done in isolation so the large pool of women in theology becomes a, a huge resource to counter the challenges that we that we face and a large pool of women and in theology also high, talks speaks to the partnerships of women in different denomination, denominations whereas i could not find this kind of uh partnership within my Pentecostal tradition, I was able to find it uh, within the circle. When I, I look at uh, the curriculums, I see it as a, a resource. I look at, uh, I see it as a, as a resource because uh, students are able to learn, students are able to commit to research. Uh, we have a master's in theology uh, in gender here in St. Paul, which I see as a big resource that uh, encourages students to concentrate on this uh on this discipline i think before it could not be seen as a, a, a as a scholarly discipline that I, that uh can even be a masters in gender but now we are seeing those kind of uh openings coming up we are seeing yes even when we have the challenges the theological resources the curriculum that have been developed a large pool of women in theology and these women are in different spaces. They are in the church spaces, they are in the society spaces, forms a sisterhood, a movement that gives strength uh, to forge forward. So that would be the end of my presentation, began by locating my presentation in my own personal experiences that made me doubt my own academic credentials that made me doubt my own legitimacy in teaching theology. But turning into what uh, the matrix have done gained, gained, helped me to feel a warmth of accompaniment of the questions, how the questions have been answered, how the questions of, uh, how the questions of legitimacy have been answered and being in a, and being in a, a space where women experiences like mine are theologized, valued, and amplified. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mary. Yes, I think uh, you have brought out well the challenges of that women face in theological education and bringing the experiences and the examples from your uh, own position, positionality of being a Pentecostal women theologist theological educator situated there and the questions that are asked to you which are not really in the curriculum or uh, what is being what is supposed to be taught in the in the class so and I really like what you said about uh, what did you say uh, that was something that you said that I really liked uh, Anyway, uh, the fourth generation, that your position as a fourth generation of rising stars. I really like that. So perhaps you could talk a little bit more about that, but not right now. That was just something that I wanted to pick up. And I think that is important to be able to acknowledge where you come from, who are the people before you and, you know, playing a role or having that commitment to mentor others who will come after you. So with that, I will open the floor for questions. If there are any questions, I'm not going to separate it. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, thank you so much, Mary. Uh, it's, it's been really good, and it is a kind of glimpse of hope. Uh, actually, we had a meeting just before this, during the lunch. We had a few ladies around us. One of um, us from Africa, she said, um, when I came to OCMS, they were constantly, constantly telling me during the operation, constantly telling me, you need to have original idea, knowledge, you need to produce a knowledge which has a gap within the system, within the knowledge things. She says, I was struggling, I couldn't understand how to, because in Africa, women are not expected to create new knowledge. 
And so what you, though she was like yourself in the theological education, teaching theology, yet she was not expected to generate knowledge, new knowledge. And so whatever she had, she was teaching, already been uh, formulated, curriculum, curriculumized by the men. There. And that actually, when listening to you, confirming what she was saying, and what is especially within when we teach or when we write as a woman, what should we do? What kind of languages do we need to use within our scholarly uh, writings and publications? So also not um, to, um, to enrich our contribution to bigger knowledge as a woman rather than merely as a theologian, as a woman theologian, as a woman theologian, African theologian. Uh, in that sense, for example, I do have lots of problems with the, some of the concepts. For example, the concept of empowerment. It's a very male patronat patronatic, what patronizing, mainly coming from the power to those who are not. What do you suggest while you are in education? What do you suggest? How can we develop a new language or something which, for example, in if you, we study leadership, because one of the things I study is leadership. When you study women's and the difference between women's and um, men's leadership and how women leadership change the leadership in general sense, it's fascinating. Can we also learn from that to form a new understanding within uh, uh, our myths as a Christian? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, maybe you could respond to that. Thank you so much. Uh, completely, um, I, I, I hear you. May I begin with the, what kind of language do we use? And um, the first criticism we receive as a circle, we use narratives as a method of doing theology, use the narrative. And we argued that our 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 stories is the beginning of our theologizing, but uh, the criticism we received that is not theological enough. Use scholarly language, narration is not. So uh, and when you speak about the languaging, and especially when we use the language of empowerment, yes, uh, I come from a school of thought of uh, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit. Because when you talk about the empowerment, the question that follows is who has the power to empower others? And myself coming from a Pentecostal tradition, I look at the Holy Spirit as the one who has the power to empower us for ministry, to empower us for, for teaching. I know it has patriarchal connotations, but my immediate thoughts was the empowerment of the Holy Spirit as an agency to dissent a power in his inclusive bestowment of spiritual gifts. I also, you also talked about new knowledge, you know, the construction of new knowledge by women, is that acceptable? Producing new knowledge, I think uh, uh, in patriarchal societies, I think women are, the production that is legitimized for women is, perhaps children, but not, not, not producing by their wombs, but not producing using their mind, which I think you are asking. But uh, new knowledge is a function of productivity through our minds, which women have to embrace producing through our minds and also producing through our wombs. So it has to be both. And women are custodians of production of knowledge as well, not just, yeah. Uh, and there was also one question that was raised about if women come into the leadership, what, what takes place in the whole set and norm of leadership? In uh, an organization, yeah. Have you, yeah, any example or what, anything to say on that? Oh, oh, would you just ask the last question again, please? What happens? Women becoming leaders and then the whole setup change in terms of women leadership, coming into leadership position. 
But one of the, the things is, uh, for example, when you study the leadership, especially the different leadership between men and women in the secular settings, and yeah. then, then how women brought a new style of leadership and which is now practiced by men as well, and yeah. without really judging that. Then my question was, should we or how can we learn from materials already there and the achievement of the women already there in the bigger sense? and then bring it into our Christian theological educational leadership practices. That was my question. Okay, thank you so much. I think I, I understand your question now. I think when women come to leadership, from my experience, is questions. Like, like I gave a whole host of questions, uh, of, of questions. And last week, we, I attended uh, a women leadership female, and I listened to the stories that the women fronted as what happened when I was introduced as a church vicar, what happened, what was the people's reaction. And I, one woman said that she went with her husband to be the pastor or to be the reverend or be, to be the leader of that church community alongside her husband. And what the congregation did when she was a reverend, her husband, who is not a, a leader, was called bishop to create that hierarchy. Her husband, never mind her, the woman was the one who was the leader. But because she went alongside her husband, the congregation did not know what to do. So to elevate the position, they called him bishop, and the woman, they called her pastor, which we found very interesting, <laughs> but she, she showed us she's still struggling with the, with the issue. <laughs> so that's what happens sometimes when women appear as leaders. Yeah, but I think there was also something that you said that when you don't have resources, that you always go back to the matriarch, not yeah, the matriarch in the circles. Yeah. You yeah. try to get something or resources help from that so is there anyone else who would like to ask questions anyone from the screen those who are joining online okay those who yes if you're joining if yeah. there is that one yeah there's that one uh, yeah uh mongila please unmute yourself yeah, Mongela is Timothy. Timothy Matosi. Okay. Oh, that is. <laughs> you, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. You may not be able to see me because of where I am. Uh, I really long to listen to this lecture. Now that is uh, being given from my context. I really wanted to hear what my sister has to say. And so I am grateful for the insights gained and for the presentation. It is good. Now, I come from the African Island Church, where for the last two decades, we have had a debate on women ordination to become reverends. Uh, for instance, I am a trained theologian. My wife is a trained theologian. We work together in the church. I am ordained. I am addressed as a reverend, but my wife is addressed as a pastor. And the debate continues, but uh, the, the, the thing that I wanted to hear uh, from our presenter today is on the question of um, the perception on um, theology by women. Because every other time that we have ended the discussions, uh, we have come to a point where we don't agree. Some of us feel that it is valid for women to be allowed to theologize, to be ordained, and to take uh, places in leadership. But others feel that it is not culturally uh, right uh, to allow that. And when the debate continues, at the end of it all, some people will say, furthermore, theology by women is not biblical. It's more of liberation theology. 
they are trying to fight and to find their space without a biblical basis. Now, I don't know what you have to say about that, uh, my sister. <laughs> wow, yeah, we had just talked about that. Um, personally, uh, I think I'll, 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 I'll just uh, say that the construction of theology and the culture, the dynamic of, of, of culture, and I'd said uh, when we did our research, we found that the old traditional patriarchal church, traditional framework, not church, seems to be operational even in the in the churches, even in the urban Pentecostalism. Therefore, it appears culture has more power than even the gospel, than even archaeology. Culture seems to to dominate the thinking because you said that we go back to the we go back to the culture personally my response to, to that would be coming from a pentecostal tradition i look at the works of the holy spirit the inclusion of holy spirit to women because remember jesus did not ordain anybody jesus did not uh he just told people to go to jerusalem and they would receive power for ministry so the kind of theology I promote is a Pentecostal theology that promotes and affirms the uh, agency of women as custodians of the Holy Spirit as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mary, I had mentioned earlier about uh, how you position yourself as the fourth generation uh, in the circle of women. Uh, so I am quite intrigued as to how you keep this, how you differentiate between the first generation, the second generation, what, how, what's your criteria? And also, yeah, you mentioned some women. Uh, some, I, I, I know most of the women that you have mentioned because they're really, uh, what would you say, theologians with theologians who have really accomplished something. And they're well known, but then all I and it looks it seems to be very nice, you know. Everyone's mentoring, everyone's helping each other, but there are their problems within the circle itself. In yeah, uh, or oh, uh, the community is never perfect, uh, obviously, yes. but there's a lot of value. The community, the community is never perfect, but there's a lot of value in the in the in the community. One criteria that is irrefutable is age. In 1989. <laughs> a lot of people who are saying they are fourth generation were not born in okay. 1980. So by their birthday, they are <laughs> excluded from being first generation. It's just uh, the people who are 10 years, I've, I've seen my, myself mentoring. So the, the people who are in their 20s and that automatically creates what we are calling as the fourth generation. The second generation are these, the women who came in from this period to this period. The fourth generation are the ones who came, who were able to go to Botswana in 2019, where a lot of us were now mature women theologizing and in the theological spaces, not in Sunday school. Uh, the one who will go to Sankofa are now women who have been born in the 19, mid nineties, who will be able. So the issue of age and the question of when did you join in becomes imperative in categorizing which generation you are. So we are anticipating even a 10th generation of the circle okay. or even beyond. But the, okay. So if can you give some examples of any problems that you see within the circle? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I think um, the, one of the problems I see uh, uh, in the circle is um, this, I, I don't know how to put it, but let me just take a minute to uh, find the wordings. It's because we are faced with different challenges. 1989 is not 2023. So they are first, because of this generation, there are generational misunderstandings. I think that's what I would highlight. 
as a first challenge. Because we are different generations, there are different generational misunderstandings. I crash with uh, those that are coming behind me because of the generation they are coming from and their outlook and what they are prioritizing. So there's a crash of ideas, there are a crash of values, the worldviews of this generation of when there's multi-generational, there's obviously what comes next is a crash of a crash of worldviews that is presented by different worldviews. And those are the, the I think that what I, I, I would highlight is the misunderstanding that are caused by uh, different generations and also to coordinate the whole continent of Africa because concerned African theologians is in the continent to coordinate all those it's frozen. She's frozen. Sometimes we, may, we can't agree, should we use womanist? Should we use feminist? We find ourselves with all these uh, questions and misunderstandings. What languaging should we use to call our theology? So we find ourselves faced with all questions and also, <laughs> Thank you. Let me just stop. Let me stop there. But I think I've hinted as to what yeah, the chat. If we have time, but we don't need to. But the question of differentiating between being a feminist and being a womanist is something I think that is quite important among the circle. So yeah. I think we can look at that if we have time later. First of all, <laughs> Naomi, please unmute. Oh, she's gone. Say bye. Oh, Are there? Yes. Hello. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation, Mary. Um, yeah, so I have a question. Um, I hope it is, uh, yeah. Um, I hope you can relate to this, but I think we've mainly talked now about women being involved in professional theology, if I could say it like that. Um, I'm not sure if you agree with my kind of qualifications, but I would say maybe that um, every person involved in a church is somehow also the theologizing if we're engaging with interpreting scripture and I was um or like faith as a lived experience and um I was wondering if um like if women in the in the Kenyan church are uh involved in uh theology or like participating in bible study groups or in any other uh capacity um, could you maybe highlight something of that? Like are like are um, the perspectives of uh, women like taken seriously or like, yeah, like are there like ex positive examples or maybe maybe also areas of growth? Thank you, Naomi. Yeah, you know, you know, women do theology through songs. They do it. Um, through their testimonies, you know how uh, African women live their Christian life. Yeah, they pray in the market before they begin selling. They pray before they they pray, and and that's part of theologizing. And uh, as a circle, and I remember this is a work of a fear. We the circle analyzed her songs, not theological statements, just her songs and see what kind of theology is being presented in women in the market. What kind of, the, and for us, that was we have been to analyze it, to theologize it, because it's data for us to see what are women thinking about Jesus? And you find women singing, Jesus is my everything. What does that mean? Yeah. And uh, after Dogame wrote, a, did a research where he found women saying, I'm married to Jesus. What do the women mean? In their in their group discussions, what do they mean? So it, they theologize. It is us who interpret it within a theological framework. In my church, there are a sisterhood group that whose work is to visit the needy people. Yeah, and uh, they call themselves Dorcas. Right, they visit, but it's within a theological framework of Dorcas, the Dorcas theology. So it's me to look and see what's happening there, what kind of the logical framework is operating here. But yeah, I see women forming all these groups 
forming Bible studies, engaging in activities within a particular theological framework. As I said, they call themselves Dorcas and operate and align their activities to what they understand in the Dorcas theological framework. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. David, David Singh. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, so I've been reading a little about um, how historical sexism and um, gender bias um, uh, can lead to all sorts of structural barriers for women who are seeking leadership positions. Uh, and just to uh, freely express themselves as theologians in their own rights in, in spaces that they inhabit. Um, and um, I, I suppose that has uh, over the years led to uh, limited access to um, networks that um, are already in existence. So uh, men ob obviously uh, are able to access these networks because they have ex um, existing relationships and net and connections with those who are already part of these networks in different parts of uh, the world. Um, uh, I suppose um, as far as female leadership networks are concerned, um, they are not as as fully developed uh, as as those networks where where men. Uh, tend to dominate leadership uh, right on the top, uh, and so that that um, is uh, a bit of a problem. I suppose uh, this whole sphere of uh, family responsibilities is another area uh, that comes in the way of women fully being able to express themselves, um, because very often in, within families and societies, it is the women who are expected to make sacrifices for the family. And often even women in leadership um, have to take leave in order to attend to a need back home yeah. uh, or downshift their careers uh, so that they have uh, greater effective flexibility to meet um, uh, the needs back at home. Um, and and they are generally speaking perceived to be the main carers um, uh, uh, in their own families, and and all of this restricts their their freedom to express themselves freely, uh, I suppose, within churches, uh, but also in theological uh, seminaries and and uh, and universities. Um, I was reading Saba Mahmood um, and her work on. Um, uh, how um, women in Islam in some parts of the world are taking leadership positions um, and because it's not being given to them, um, they are claiming it back for themselves uh, and, and they understand that it's simply impossible for them to find spaces within the existing structures and so they have gone ahead in creating their own um, masjids or mosques um, and and this is leading to um, um, to what is called the alternative mosque movement. Uh, mm. I, I don't suppose uh, Christian women scholars or, or theologians have to take such a drastic step because there are um, there is an intent uh, for what is called positive discrimination. Um, although uh, some of us have difficulties with. Uh, the, the the word empowerment, as Sarah uh, indicated right at the start, but I suppose positive discrimination is is something necessary in some parts of the world, where without that it's impossible for women to, um, to find space for themselves in, in some of these established networks. So I I, I don't know I'm rambling, but. Um, I'm just wondering if if you could say a little bit about um, um, you know these um, some of the comments I have made, uh, particularly um, you know how structural barriers um, affect your ability to express yourself as a leader in your own right, as a theologian in your own right. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. 
I will not. Um, but but I think you have you have you have raised a uh, very important uh, points that uh, were at the back of my mind as I as I present. And you say because of long tradition of structural absence of women. So, for example, what do women do when they find themselves alone in a board, in a board meeting? What do a female student do when they find themselves alone in a class of 30? Those are the questions we are, we are so what do I do when I find myself in a class of 30 and I'm the only I'm the teacher, and I'm the, these are the, the real practical examples that come when I'm in a class of that, and they are all just. I, I had that class, I think last year, and before I started that class, I I I had to prepare, acclimatize myself with a pulpit, just go and prepare myself, have breakfast, drink water, and now come ready. You know, so those are some of the practical issues, and I see it. Yeah, I, I, I see it in, in my um, research projects. Yes. And you are told, uh, present the woman perspective, the pressure that, that come with that, represent the African woman voice. You know, the, the, pressure that, the pressure that come with that, I, I hear you, we have, we lag behind in catching up, but we are somewhere, we are making headways to catch up, we realize the gap. We realize we uh, in Kenya we have two female bishops. In the Anglican Church, we have two female bishops. But what do they do in the bishop councils? Just the two of them. <laughs> just, the, just and it's structural. It has a long tradition. So the entry, and even remaining there and being of value, not just or oh, saying we have two female bishops, being of value in that very powerful space becomes an urgent question for those of us who have started to come in. How do we contribute? How do we become of value? How do we maintain and invite others? In the circle we say, if you are alone, bring another sister. And that other sister, bring another sister. And we form a community within the, these very powerful spaces. Yeah. I think, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Good. In, in response to um, David Singh's comment, actually, um, when we talk about women oppressed and marginalized in different contexts in the world, we're simply thinking about um, empowerment, how we can empower women. But from my viewpoint, actually, before we talk about empowerment, we have to think about two other things prior to empowerment. One is conscientization, which means we have to educate women to understand that they are oppressed. In some contexts, women do not, they are not aware of being oppressed. So conscientization is necessary and then liberation or emancipation. So without, I think, conscientization and emancipation, empowerment is not working because they are limited. Now, as you say, two women and two bishop women in that country, what can they do? They are empowered personally, but they cannot do much. So that is one thing that we have to think about. The second one, I think your lecture is very clear and you mentioned about challenges and barriers and obstacles. As women theologians, you mentioned about, um, you know, the, um, the patriarchal theological uh, kind of framework and male dominance. And then interestingly, you, bring, you brought two countermeasures. One is theological resources. And another one is large pool of theologians, women theologians. And when you talk about uh, theological resources, I think it's not about only about material things you mentioned, but there are other things as well. And from my viewpoint, the most important theological resources is to identify cutting edge research topics, which has got really potential mm. to change. Um, and the uh, topics could be identified by only women. Women can see something that men cannot see. And mm -hmm. women theologians may have tendency to go into the men's world and simply try to provide different kind of interpretations. Yeah. But does it work? I don't think that is working. They may ignore your opinions. 
you have to identify your own cutting edge transformative research topics so that you can contribute original contribution in that particular area. In that way, you can raise your voice, you can change the society. So I wonder what kind of effort you, you are making through your circle to identify really important topics. Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, let me begin by the concern, the concerns that, that you say, and, and thank you so much. Uh, I will finish with the efforts. Uh, personally, the person who put the concerns in me was my grandmother. She did not go to school, so we see already it's not uh, an academic exercise, but she could not read and write. She, she told me, as you, what you'll have to do to me, emancipate yourself is education plus Jesus. It's my grandmother who told me those words. It's education plus Jesus. My grandmother, I wonder, how did she know that? She told me in this in this space, I don't know what she meant, it's, but she said it in my mother language. She said here now, what you have to do to emancipate yourself is through education. So today, when I think about those words, I wonder how many women of her generations were as smart as her, just as smart as us, but never got the opportunity. Now just uh, who had the conscience that did not get from academy, but they got it from God-given intuition to realize that they lag behind and they did education and the region to forge forward as well. What am I doing? Um, I can see some of my students here, female students, and they have, they have joined, some have left, and they just uh, texted me and they said, I take the challenge to do theology as a woman. I take uh, the challenge to study. So in literal types, as a teacher, both in a university and within my church, myself, my presence speaks to the women agency in the logical education in the church community, my only presence speaks to that, encourages others, inspires others, and also in the academic level, I'm doing research, I'm publishing, I'm teaching, I'm working hard to be to, to be a mercy amber to somebody else who is looking, who is 15 and looking up to up to me. But thank you so much for for that. But I I, I hear you and I will Put more efforts. Thank you, Mary. Timothy, are, do you still have a question or you have forgotten to put down your hand? No, mine is not a question as such. I actually wanted to make a contribution, although it's kind of escaped my mind. But uh, I am thinking of the biblical language, the patriarchal language of the Bible. And also uh, kind of asking myself now, what is the future? What, 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 what does Mary envision to be the future of, uh, okay, women theology mm -hmm. uh, in, in Kenya and in Africa? And mm -hmm. especially when we go back now to the biblical text, some of which have been controversial when it comes to addressing matters of women and church leadership. I think I have a very easy answer that I have found through engagement with others. And yeah. when I looked at, I, I believe if you read a Swahili Bible, there's, yes. no, that, there's no that patriarchal language yet. A person is a person, right? God is God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's a, that's a problem of the English. When you read your Swahili Bible, God is God. God, general pronouns. In my cook, yeah? yeah, that's not yeah. our problem. You agree with me? I've had you agreeing with me. That's not our oh, problem. Of course, that, that, that's why I raised that because mm -hmm. I, I wanted you to go back now. You talked of resources, so I really mm -hmm. wanted to hear you come back to our resources now uh, to, 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 to help the, the community. <laughs> and one of the strengths is that God is God. God is not he or she. In our community, mm -hmm. God is God, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, yeah, Timothy, for raising that very important questions of, you know, the language that if it's yeah. sometimes things get complicated when it's 
we have to translate and speak in English, we say something else which we otherwise would not say in our own yeah. local language. So that is also one problem, translation problem, which is also a topic by itself, and we will not go sure. into that. Uh, yeah. I did tell you I we should get back to something earlier. I forgot that now. Yeah. Anyway, while I try to remember, anyone else who has a question? Or Mary, would you like to add anything else? Okay, I remember now. It was about the usage of feminists and womenists. Yeah. So that's a, that's also an issue of um, an issue of uh, an issue of English language, because if you are speaking in Swahili or my language, you would not be dragged in that discussing the whole day what we are going to say, with because uh, in my language, it would just mean mutumi and we are we get over the discourse. Everybody understand and everybody agrees. Will not be dragged in the which language which language again the problem of english language but uh of course there's that discourse some feel we cannot adopt the feminist languaging which is language the language used in the global north kind of uh, life so we need ours and then the womanist again they say that is used in the black american experience in in the global north so we arrived at african woman theologies as a, acceptable as what we saw addressing our problem, but those discourses keep moving for keep going. But as I said, I told you, Marina, if you were speaking in my language, that would not be an issue. We would not spend one minute discussing it. There are no such dichotomies in my language or in Swahili language. Yes, I think I understand that because you have the feminists, which is mainly coming from arising in the global north, and then you have the black women who comes up yeah. with the you know, alternative term of women is and in Africa itself it's not a problem at all because those are English words so thank you very much for that uh, and with that I think we will end our seminar today and we look forward to having you all again the participants next week we will have Esther Mongo who is I don't know maybe is she the first generation or second generation mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Make it into the first generation. I'm not too sure. We will have Esther Mombo speaking to us on, uh, I think she's going to talk about the Quakers. Yeah. Oh, wow. And yeah, thank you. And by the way, Mary is, I don't know you. Yeah. You, yeah. Thank you very much. I just appreciate your presence because we have always looked upon you as a young woman. <laughs> and now you are giving us a presentation. I'm getting old. I'm getting old. <laughs> You're getting <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me and thank